So, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, please allow me to welcome all of you, uh, both our audience and our distinguished speakers at our uh, uh, in, uh, seminar, uh, Solidarity in the European Union, with the provocative subtitle, Does it exist? Uh, with a question mark, the view or the views from the capitals. Um, uh, I will uh, briefly introduce the topic uh, and I will also introduce our uh, speakers here. Um, and then I'll immediately pass the floor to them. So let me just say a few words about our topic. Um, solidarity is um, a central term, or seems to be a central term in uh, European integration. Interestingly, I was trying to dig up uh, some old uh, documents and found that there is a direct reference to solidarity, even in the famous Schumann Declaration of 1950, uh, quote, Europe will not be made all at once or according to a single plan. It will be built through concrete achievements, which first create a de facto solidarity. So solidarity on the one hand is clearly a central building block of the integration process, um, but it still seems to be kind of secondary compared to, um, uh, you know, the transactional utilitarian concepts on which the single market is built, for instance. Uh, even the structural funds are mostly defined as a redistributive mechanism and not as e expression as an expression of solidarity. So, so we had from the very start uh, a tension between this lofty rhetoric um, uh, by Robert Schumann and also by the by the treaty on the one hand and the practical design of the of the integration process and the single market as uh, transactional utilitarian in nature. Um, and the second point that I want to raise at the very start is that solidarity is uh, typically, if you again look at the documents, the solidarity, famous solidarity clause, article 222 of the treaty, uh, solidarity is always understood as solidarity among member states. So it's not interpersonal between peoples, but state to state solidarity, which also means that solidarity is kind of filtered through the lenses of national politics, dependent on the decisions of the governments of the member states. So national politics, to some extent, to a large extent, defines how solidarity is played out in the EU. And that is where we come in with our seminar and also the forthcoming book on which it is based. We were hoping that we would have the book already now, but there is a slight delay in the production process. But uh, at least we can show you the, the book cover. Um, if I must, my, may ask my colleague for, for the book cover so that uh, we can tease our uh, viewers with, uh, with the cover. doesn't seem to be coming. Okay, so then that will allow the also, as you can see, there are some delays, not only in the production, but also regarding the book cover. But, uh, but oh, it is coming. So that's it. As you can see, uh, we also have one of the editors uh, among us and the book uh, title, European Solidarity in Action and the Future of Europe, Views from the Capitals. Um, thank you, thank you, uh, Peter, and we can switch back, thank you. Um, so uh, the three distinguished speakers we have here are all contributors to, to, to this book with their excellent chapters. Let me say a few words about, about each of them, starting with uh, Katarina Sørensen, who is uh, a deputy director at Think Tank Europa, uh, but she also has extensive work experience at the EU's external action service in the European Commission and at the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, she also worked for the Danish Institute of Inter for International Studies with, with which we, our institute cooperates very closely. And as I said, uh, uh, the author of an excellent chapter in the book. Uh, our second speaker is uh, Senem Aydin Duskit. 
who is a professor of international relations at uh, Sabanchi at the Sabanchi University uh, and also academic affairs coordinator at the Istanbul Policy Center, widely published in top journals, so I'm sure you have come across her name already. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, a contributor to our book as well. And finally, uh, uh, one of the editors of the book, uh, Michael Keding, uh, professor of uh, European Union politics at University of Duisburg Essen, uh, uh, a visiting fellow at the APA in Maastricht, and also at Person and Jean Monnet uh, chair at uh, Duisburg Essen. So welcome all of you. And without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor to you, uh, starting with Katharina, then to Salem and then to Mikhail, um, uh, with uh, the view from, from Copenhagen on solidarity and European integration. So Katharina, welcome and the floor is yours. Thanks, Peter. Thanks very much. It's always great to get an invitation from Prague. I was a student at Charles University at Europeum back in 2002, so I spent a semester. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, that's, that's great. Thank you. And, uh, and really liked it there. So, uh, so even if it's just virtually, I'm very happy to, to be with you today. And um, I think your question is very fair of solidarity at all exists. I mean, I think there are some good examples with Brexit after Brexit among the 27 that, yes, there is solidarity. Uh, in, in some respects, but now that I'm focused on, on Denmark and focused on the aftermath of the COVID crisis, uh, I think it's quite fair to say that there have been a number of examples where Denmark has really not been in a very solidaric light. Um, <clears throat> during the COVID, uh, the pan-European think tank, European Council on Foreign Relations, did a tracker called the Solidarity Tracker, where they tried to count the number of times a member state was solidaric. Uh, with the exception of Malta, a very small country, the smallest member state, Denmark was at the bottom of the list in terms of, of um, displays of solidarity. Uh, there, are, there are obviously ways of counting this, but still I think it, it's, it shows that uh, a bit of Denmark's inclinations here. Then on vaccines, um, we know today how much the European joint approach has benefited a small member state like Denmark, but back in spring when it looked less likely that it would be successful and there were delays. Um, our prime minister in Denmark, Mette Frederiksen, she went on a, um, she went outside the EU framework. She went on a trip to Israel to see if she could make deals um, bilaterally. She went with Austria, but still it was outside the EU framework. And she also made, went public with some plans to build vaccine factories in Denmark that was supposed to first supply vaccines to Denmark. Uh, she also was uh, drew headlines and eyebrows for in the middle of the AUKUS submarine crisis uh, where France got snubbed by Australia. She went out and uh, expressed support for the US and was basically telling France to not uh, be too upset because the US would always be a, a, the strongest partner for, for you for most European countries. Um, Denmark is also a very vocal member of the Frukel Alliance. Um, that's the alliance that campaigns for a smaller EU budget. It's obviously an alliance of net contributing countries, so it's about paying less, and it's also about not having joint debt and so on. Um, <clears throat> and then we, uh, we have opt-outs in Denmark. So very formally, we are not taking part in a lot of initiatives where we still benefit from the rest of Europe having a joint approach. That goes for the whole area of defense policy where we have an opt-out as the only member state. It goes for justice and home affairs where we also are the only country with a full opt-out. So on any kind of difficult talks on migration, solidarity, relocation of asylum seekers, we're automatically just outside. And on the Euro, we have an opt-out where we uh, were not part of some of the bailouts of for Greece after the financial crisis and so on. So we've we've able to to really um, be a member state that's that doesn't take part in some of the more difficult displays of solidarity that have been necessary recently. Um, <clears throat> so um, at some point, I think, especially with the opt-outs, this really brings Denmark to the bottom of a scale of of solidarity in the EU. At the same time, um, it, it is difficult to make a picture, uh, to, to make any such score 
because I mean, part of the story is also that Denmark is a very loyal member state. If you look at who transposes EU directives the first, exactly. we're probably top of the class. If you look at who is adhering most strictly to the letter and spirit of the treaties in terms of values, Denmark would clearly also be, be top of the class. Um, we are net contributor to the budget, obviously, and quite happy with membership. So that's also part of the story. And more globally, we are one of the biggest contributors of, of the development aid per capita. So um, I want to just put forward two different uh, possible explanations for why the Danish uh, behavior is as it is, if, if you wish. And I think, uh, and that was also what, the, what you were uh, talking about more broadly for the seminar, Peter, is, is um, solidarity as such is, is just not part of the Danish story of what European integration should be about. Um, I think the prime minister has summed up this very clearly, uh, um, our prime minister after she went, she agreed to the bigger budget in the summer of, of 2020. And she went out having to explain why she agreed to the bigger budget. And she said, and I quote, Denmark is a small economy dependent on our exports. Someone needs to buy our product. So we are very dependent on a well-functioning well internal market. That's why there is a need for solidarity. And we know some countries need help after COVID. But I mean, that's a trade relationship above anything else. Um, <clears throat> Denmark is not in the EU to have some kind of brotherhood of, of man, but to safeguard our trade. And that's uh, the approach to membership is, is economic. It's about utility um, above anything else. And that's why it's the political nature of the EU that gives Denmark a need to take distance. And I think it's a very, very deep, if you look at the Eurobarometer public opinion polls, you find the Danes are probably the population in the EU that's most concerned about giving up sovereignty, most concerned about qualified majority voting, concerned about a strong commission, a strong parliament, the supranational or federal elements of the EU. So that's a very deep skepticism in Denmark. And um, if it's the commission deciding that now we need solidarity, or if it's somehow um, implied that Denmark, it's, it's not, it's, it's in the system, it's in the political nature of the EU rather than a unilateral decision of member states, then I think the, it's that way of, it's that um, formalization or the, the process of then being solidaric that Denmark would have odds with more so than, than the solidarity itself. It's the political nature of the EU, the fact that there is a, a, a tight union where solidarity is a requirement that Denmark as a nation state with a very strong fear of losing sovereignty would have a problem with. And then the second explanation is quite is, is much more straightforward. Um, I mean, by many standards, Denmark is a very, very well-functioning society. If you look at almost any indicator, if it's trust, if it's happiness, if it's affluence, uh, uh, gross national BNP, um, Denmark does very, very well. So uh, we're also lucky we don't share a border with a threatening neighbor. We're not very exposed to natural, um, natural disasters. We're not the most exposed to, to climate change. So I think there's a very, very rooted perception that EU solidarity is simply not something that Denmark is likely to come asking for anytime soon. Uh, but it's something that we might, on a number of occasions, be asked to show to others. And I think this I mean, the, the type of change of threats we've seen in recent years are much more hybrid than classic threats. So this might change with future generations. But I think to the current picture of Danish uh, solidarity, I think there is some, there's also this element of quid per quo in, in this story. But I wanted to end there, Peter, just with this initial uh, reflections on your... On Thank your, you. Thank you. I, if I, uh, this is a great summary. Just, just a brief follow-up question, something that I think might be interesting for our Czech audience as well, because what you describe is not that dissimilar from how the EU is perceived here in, in the Czech Republic. But at the same time, there is kind of increasing an increasing worry that the position, you know, that you pick and choose is unstable or not tenable in the long term. Is there a discussion about that in Denmark as well, or is it just the cozy place <clears throat> that you want to keep on the kind of periphery, not in the core of the EU, and that is something that wants to be perpetuated as long as possible by, by the country's elite? 
I think actually in Denmark that many Danes would be surprised if others had the same concern as Denmark. I think there's a feeling that we are somehow uh, the exception, I mean, together with the UK, admittedly, but that somehow um, the continental way of doing politics was more suited for something like the EU to form and to be a deep and committing cooperation, and we were more of the fringes on this. Right. And um, so I think that would that would first of all be a bit of a surprise that we were more in the same boat as everyone else on this, and and that's why I think. Uh, we, if, if there were more demands for exceptions, I'm not sure Denmark would be so flexible and certainly not on the rule of law to have any kind of um, flexibility given. I think there would be some kind of an, <laughs> bit, maybe a bit paradoxical an insistence that the rules need to be followed and, and it's just us being exceptional. But I think the question of, um, of, of, of other, like Germany now, Merkel has, her legacy was very much one of keeping Europe together. I think with the new go German government, there might be more of a tendency to then say, we go, we go in smaller groups. And I think where Denmark would then position itself is very, it's a very open question uh, because we do see ourselves as, as a core member. And so we have a bit of a paradoxical situation. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think it would come as a surprise if other countries were more similar to us than we think. That's interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Katharina, very much. And from uh, the, the north, we are moving to, to the south, another uh, country that uh, is very important for the European Union, even though it's not a member, Turkey, um, a country that um, has had a long-term uh, difficult relationship with the European Union. Senan, tell us what is the Turkish view of solidarity and, and in relation to the integration process? Okay, thank you very much, Petra. And I'd like to also thank you for inviting me to this event and also to the wonderful editors of the book and Michael as well himself, since he's here. Um, now, um, let me just start perhaps by talking a little bit about what solidarity is and how it's perceived with respect to the overall EU-Turkey relationship. And then perhaps zoom in onto the specifics of this, right? Where do we see solidarity or where we don't see solidarity and on in which instances of crises in particular? Now, of course, the notion of solidarity is a concept that is rarely discussed in the EU-Turkey relationship today, mostly because of the lack of solidarity that both sides presume for one another. Now, on the Turkish side, the dominant perception is that the European Union shows very little solidarity with Turkey, um, especially on migration, right? Of course, there is an EU-Turkey migration deal, as I'm sure um, all of us know, everybody knows by now, and that this seems to be somehow working despite some flaws and problems. Uh, but however, um, there is also this uh, discourse that is pushed by the government that you know, the, the EU doesn't do its share of or doesn't undertake its basically the burden that it promised to undertake in terms of financial commitments, et cetera. And so it doesn't really act so much in solidarity with Turkey since Turkey is hosting more than 4 million refugees. Now that's of course one sort of negative I would say, a uh, way in which sort of the solidarity discourse and uh, is undermined. Uh, and of course, you know, there are also on the other hand, you know, these geopolitical conflicts that are very prevalent in the relationship where you don't really get to a debate on solidarity because there is so much discussion on conflict. I mean, right now, of course, we seem to, we did have a brief de-escalation regarding the conflict in the Mediter Eastern Mediterranean during the summer. But now that conflict seems to be escalating again with the bilateral deals, for instance, between um, Cyprus and Egypt and France and Greece, et cetera. So that seems to be you know, on the horizon. So in, in a you know, sort of heightened context of geopolitical anxiety, of course, there's very little scope for discussion of solidarity. Now, this is of course more for the you know, Turkish official position and the discourse of AKP. On the other hand, if you sort of zoom in on the Turkish you know, domestic uh, politics and society, you see that among more pro-democratic, more pro-Western circles in Turkey, there is also the belief that EU shows very little solidarity with them, right? So here, you know, solidarity defined by whom and for whom is an important question. I think that needs to be tackled. And this goes to show how important this is, 
because the perception there is that the EU shows very little uh, solidarity with you know, pro-democratic uh, circles in Turkey or with the opposition, precisely because it tries to uphold its own interests, uh, mostly regarding, of course, migration, right? So you have that kind of discourse bubbling or building up also um, in the last years as well. Now, of course, as we did cover in uh, the book, where we focused mostly on the COVID crisis and the instances of solidarity during COVID. So let me mention a few things about that as well, which, of course, we unpack uh, much more in the book chapter that I co-authored with Özgehan Şenyuba from Meteo. Um, now, there we argue that, you know, that there have been a very brief instance of solidarity between EU and Turkey um, in the earlier months of the COVID crisis, where Turkey was sending medical assistance to various EU countries, the countries of the Western Balkans, other Eastern neighborhood countries, etc. So it was sending masks. You know, COVID test kits, other protective health sanitary equipment, et cetera, et cetera. But this period was very short lived, right? And Turkey was branding this as, as part of its aid diplomacy, right? And it was largely strategically driven because it was driven by the idea that if it engaged in aid diplomacy as such, it would further strengthen its international presence in relation to Europe, which it contests externally in their wider and shared neighborhood. And at the same time, it could sell it to the domestic audience as, you know, as a sign of good governance at home. So the idea was that, you know, we are way more than sufficient for ourselves, while Europe is disintegrating once again, under yet another crisis, just like, you know, Euro crisis, migration crisis, all of it. And, you know, we're there to help. So we are the superior party here. So this was, in fact, the logic or the driver behind these policies, but they were very short lived. And why were they short lived? Well, because, you know, Europe uh, managed to overcome its initial crisis of solidarity, which it experienced, especially, of course, between the North and the South. Um, and then um, so there was and also Turkey started to uh, witness an upsurge in numbers and th the real sort of weight of the COVID crisis hit it at home. So and then, of course, you have the geopolitical again conflicts rising up to the agenda once again, once, you know, COVID was taken as, as just a reality that, you know, both parties had to live with. Um, so so that was a very, very brief uh, period as such. So not now what we see is that, again, we are mostly back to the conflictual state of things with, as I mentioned, the Eastern Mediterranean and geopolitical rivalries also reflecting on public opinion with the rise of anti-Western discourse in Turkey. Um, but I would also highlight that there is still ground for acts of solidarity between the EU and Turkey, perhaps not currently at the national level at the top, but more so at the local level and at the level of the citizenry. Because in Turkey, you see that solidarity is very deeply rooted at the individual level, both in terms of attitudes and practices. So for instance, in COVID as well, we've seen a lot of local and regional um, initiatives of solidarity, again, initiated and owned by citizens, you know, less so perhaps at the transnational level, but more so at the national level. So there is scope there for more interaction, also given the increasing uh, prevalence of cooperation at the local level between European municipalities and major municipalities within Turkey, like, for instance, Istanbul and Ankara. We see, for instance, that the Istanbul mayor recently hosted a major uh, summit for the mayors of Western Balkan countries. So you see this sort of increasing cooperation between the often uh, oppositional mayors and governors, etc., at the local level that have problems with central administrations, not in every case, but in some cases at least, and that go into, you know, that sort of explore other areas of cooperation. And I think those areas are where we might expect to see more instances of solidarity in the future as well, in the case that they are developed uh, further. Now, I could continue, but um, I think my time is up, Pet, right? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, for, so for I'll the, finish it at that yeah, for now. Thank you very okay. much. Sorry for the technical problem. Mm -hmm. 
uh, so perhaps a, again a follow a brief follow up question. So would you say this is a, a sustained strategy, uh, either by uh, by uh, um, uh, the government or even by the opposition to present, you know, the narrative of Turkey being an alternative center of solidarity compared to the EU, or is it rather in the background, not explicitly for framed as such? Would you say that there is a, you know, like the, the, the point of competition or rivalry saying, look, we yes. as a center work better than, than the European Union does? Yes, I think there is. But we have to, I think, have to have a nuanced understanding of this in the sense that you don't really see that discourse among the opposition, however divided right. the opposition might be. So you see more of that in the actual government discourse. Right. And you see the notion of solidarity come up increasingly in the government's relations, for instance, with countries in Africa, right? Mm -hmm. When you see mm -hmm. how the government tries to increase or the state, the Tur Turkey starts, it tries to increase its presence in Africa, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, elsewhere, it uses the solidarity discourse. It argues that there is this natural solidarity that there is there uh, that goes all the way back to the shared religion, history, identity, whatever, which the Europeans lack. So yes, it does become, it does get instrumentalized in other words, mm -hmm. right? In the way of a certain foreign policy um, agenda. And again, it uses that solidarity discourse to show that and to tell the public as well that we need to, or the Turkish public needs to show acts of solidarity in hosting the Syrian migrants, for instance, that this is something that we're capable of, but the Europeans are not, right? And he uses this, this course a lot in the global space as well to sort of to pit Turkey as a more normative actor that that you know pay, that pays attention to these things rather than Europe that just externalizes this foreign policy among others and so cannot take a principled foreign policy stance on these issues so yes oh that's interesting thank you thank you thank you very much uh Sinem. I think there will be some more questions coming up later but let me turn to our last speaker and and as I said the uh, one of the editors of the book so perhaps uh, Michal will come again and perhaps uh, I know that you uh, want to speak about the German case, but perhaps because you are the one who probably uh, has read the book several times maybe. Uh, uh, and we so far have heard uh, uh, diverse but rather critical voices when speaking about the national backgrounds. Is that, is that the story that we hear from the other Capital. Is it is it the dominant narrative that we have in the chapters, or is it you know like rare exceptions and it's just an accident that here at this meeting we have um, Turkey and Denmark and the Czech Republic? So Michal, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction and the invitation and uh, for organizing this event. I'm very happy to to see you, Peter, Sinem, and also Katarina, uh, all three of them, uh, excellent contributions to this journey, this European journey through uh, solidarity in action with 41 chapters, different national perspectives on solidarity in action. And whether now it has always been, let's say, more um, this kind of uh, negative connotation, to be very frank, the picture is very, very mixed. We have very different, um, and this is in the end what this book is all about. Katarina said huh? she's surprised to hear and to learn now about the Czech example. And that's exactly why we have this book, because I think in order to make the European integration process um, um, a success, uh, in the long run, we need this kind of information to learn more about what's going on in the various countries beyond the usual suspects. And, um, and we see, uh, zooming into the various chapters, that solidarity in action takes many very different shapes and forms. Um, we have seen um, Katarina and Sanem and also your questions, uh, Petra, you put forward. Um, we, there is always a notion or the question whether that should be a reciprocal kind of process, right? Based on reciprocity, is it something that we give in good times and that we receive in bad times? Is it something more uh, based on economic grounds as it self pure self interest and this this something no 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 we don't want in the European Union or whether this is actually one of the drivers of European integration and as Katarina made very clear and I think that was very 
important and everyone should be reminded all 27 EU member states already have very different reasons for being in the European Union. And obviously these national narratives, they differ and accordingly also the narratives around solidarity in action differ. To take one maybe very concrete example, I was astonished and I highly recommend next to reading the Turkish, the Czech and obviously also the Danish chapter, um, if you read the Polish chapter, for example, it's, it's really remarkable if you read the Polish chapter, because then all of a sudden you start realizing, hey, apparently solidarity is not a concept based on reciprocity, because if you read the Polish chapter, the authors would argue Poland expects to receive solidarity, full stop. <laughs> okay, and that's extremely interesting, because uh, what we learn is that it is a deserving country, that's what the authors would argue, a deserving country which was betrayed by its allies, uh, forced to the Soviet zone, and solidarity with Poland is a needed compensation, so to say, for the misfortune this experienced. So the argument of the Polish um, authors. It is extremely interesting to read this, and then you start reading and you start thinking, oh, okay, that put things quite in a different perspective. Also, the ongoing discussions we have right now with regard to the rule of law and the way uh, communication or miscommunication between Warsaw and the European Union, Brussels, the institutions um, uh, work. So, and this again is really what this book is all about. It really gives very different perspectives. And the Polish chapter may be an extreme in itself because it's really making the point no reciprocity, if there is no reciprocity, we expect uh, the European Union to be, um, to show solidarity. Uh, but these are the stories which are extremely interesting. A gloomy chapter uh, in many respects, because this chapter focuses also on COVID, particularly uh, on the first, uh, two, uh, first wave, is the Italian chapter. I mean, this is really something you read and you just think, oh my God, it, it it went terribly wrong in all different kinds of directions, right? Uh, Ital Italy, Italians shouting out for help and none of us uh, in the EU capitals responding, uh, leaving them alone, uh, not offering any support or help. Actually, in the first couple of days and weeks, as you know, we all shut our borders or many of us uh, without consulting each other, right? Luxembourg was about to die, yeah? So the author would argue because a country that depends on 70% from workforce from abroad the, of the borders, right? From France, from Germany, from Belgium, overnight, no access to employees. So the country was literally dying uh, with, with the uh, unilateral kind of unsolidary uh, in practice uh, in action. But at the same time, we have seen, and Katerina elaborated on this, right? Um, read the Irish chapter, and you will see that it is a case in times of Brexit that we can always show, and hopefully we will also talk more about when teaching about the European Union, right, that this island was showered by solidarity during the Brexit negotiations. All 27 EU member states rallied behind, or 26, rallied behind the Irish position vis-a-vis -vis the UK, and including the Hungarian government, including the Polish government, and we tend not to talk about it. It, it is ex exceptional. It was the European Commission negotiating on behalf of the European Union, and all the member states, they simply agreed. And all these bilateral efforts by the prime ministers in the UK to, to go on, on city hopping in capitals and to divide and conquer, well, it didn't work. Not at all. Nowhere. They were always pointing to the European Commission, right? Uh, an extremely interesting chapter also to read. Um, now, and that brings me to maybe something else. We are focusing here for obvious reasons on the member states' perspectives, right? Views from the capitals. And I think I'm convinced that this is extremely important to talk more about, to really understand what's going on beyond Paris and Berlin. Um, but allow me maybe a little footnote uh, also that the European Union and coming back to Katerina, right, the, the missing narrative in Denmark, maybe, right, it's, it's also that the European Union 
itself that solidarity is a European value, right? To start off with, Peter, you refer to the solidarity clause, but actually if you read article two even, right? Solidarity is mentioned. So it is a value and Katarina mentioned- Total values, yes. Right, right. And, and Katarina mentioned also for the Danes, right? For them, um, uh, the principles, the rules, uh, uh, the norms, the values in article two are important. Well, solidarity is part of it. and. Uh, and, and it is a motive for action um, uh, for, for many. And in fact, the EU institutions are inspired by this aspect of European solidarity. This is why, for example, we have digressive proportionality in the European Parliament, right? Because we want to give also the smallest of all EU member states a minimum number of members of the European Parliament to make them heard and to make to help them to 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 be operational in the European Parliament. This is why we have QMV, the qualified majority, which the Danes apparently do not like so much, are more concerned as we just learned again from Katarina, but in the end, it is also a principle um, uh, um, a showing um, or a being inspired by European solidarity because it's not only about the numbers of, of countries, it's also of the, uh, the citizens, it's double majority, it's both. Uh, it's pure solidarity in many respects. Um, um, or the club spirit in the European Council, right, where we continue to adopt uh, positions um, by unanimity. Uh, no qualified majority. It is really something uh, where the heads of state and government sit together and they do respect each other because they do represent sovereign independent member states. Uh, in this club. Uh, and it's not just because the German Chancellor speaks out that everyone is quiet. Um, not at all. Uh, it, it is really this club spirit that everyone uh, speaks up and um, and we can all by sudden talking about Turkey, right, rally around a Cypriot uh, position, uh, right? And yeah, and in, Cyp in Cyprus, we would probably consider this to be solidarity in action. Um, so bringing me maybe uh, to my um, last point. Um, so next to uh, solidarity inspires EU institutions and solidarity is a European mo uh, value and a motive for action. Um, you mentioned, Petter, it's also a cornerstone of European integration process from the very early beginning. In the end, and that's how I would maybe conclude here, and I would lo look forward to discussions or maybe also elaborate a little bit of what we can then do about solidarity, lack of solidarity, is the fact that European solidarity in the end is about understanding each other, being aware about the differences and the interdependencies. Huh? If we want to adapt narratives, it's about talking about these interdependencies, economic interdependencies, but also political, cultural interdependencies, and they vary to a great extent. We have all very different narratives why we are and want to be in the European Union. Talk about those narratives. Understand that Finland is in the European Union for military security concerns mostly. And these are very different from German interests, for example, right? Uh, being part of the uh, European integration process. So it's about understanding uh, the differences and the interdependencies and, um, um, and, 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 and actually showing the willingness uh, to, to, to listen to those differences. Uh, and, and this is, that's why I like uh, your event, because this, in the end, what we need much more, um, that we have EU citizens thinking more about, okay, now I know the Czech position. So what is, what is actually the Swedish position on this? Or what is, uh, right, the Portuguese position in this? Because in the end, the European Union will only work if the 27 member states and its citizens um, work together. Thank you very much and back to you, Peter. Thank you, thank you. And again, a, a brief question for you as well, because you know all the chapters and we have sent them here from, from Turkey. Yeah. My question would be, do you find any kind of commonality? Because we have quite a few chapters that are written uh, analyzing the situation in non-member states, right? In, in the Balkan countries, in Eastern Europe, in Turkey, would you say that there is some kind of common threat uh, common, uh, perhaps, perhaps something um, along the lines Senan described uh, in Turkish in the Turkish case. Yeah, I mean, there is see... a kind of distrust that the EU does not really show yeah. solidarity. Is that a common theme? Yeah. Or yeah. So 
Um, those chapters focusing specifically also on this first wave of COVID, um, they all underlie very much. I mean, most Balkan states would underline actually uh, Turkey, Turkey's presence. Um, uh, it's eight programs. And it's not only Turkey. Um, uh, the worrying thing is that most of these chapters would also point at China and Russia, uh, very much so. Um, and then being there where the European Union basically still was shutting down its borders, basically, um, the internal borders. So, um, yes, so that is something you hear quite often in, 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 in a number of chapters specifically um, from non-EU member states. At the same time, allow me maybe to make this point as well, we have also very interesting concepts that work regionally, so regional solidarity. Um, yeah, like the Baltic states, for example, if uh, Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia, independently, all those three chapters um, refer to the Baltic bubble experience dur during, um, during the COVID uh, experience, uh, them not shutting down their external borders, then they left their borders open because in the bubble in the, of the Baltic states, and this apparently worked very, very well, and, and, and it made possible that actually the employers and employees were moving back and forth and that actually a little bit of the internal market, market was preserved on their own initiative, regional mm. solidarity in action. Mm. Mm. I, I still have one more question I want to ask. It goes beyond the, the book, but you know, frankly, when you mentioned Turkey and, and it might be a question for Selem as well and Katarina, um, uh, when we, you know, uh, and this is not just propaganda, right? That that this perception that uh, that Russia and China and Turkey uh, uh, provided some help, while the European Union, which uh, some countries of which are even a, a member states, right, did not in the first phase. How come? How do you explain that? Is it just simply that the countries that are more autocratic uh, react more swiftly, or? Um, but what would be your explanation for that? But that, because that is clearly not, and I'm just repeating that, it's just un, not, not just about propaganda, right? It's also about delivering some aid to some countries. How do you explain that? Michal, what do you think? And then perhaps Senem as well. Yeah, I could start maybe. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> this is actually quite a difficult this, the, the question also because it has this time component in there, right? So not everyone was hit at the same time uh, by COVID at the very early beginning. So the Chinese had already their long-term experience, so to say, right? And they had it much long before it actually then uh, arrived. Uh, and we were all looking at Italy kind of scared and worried, but it was also pretty much localized, specifically in the northern part of Italy. And we saw, right, the coffins piling up and everything, and we were really worried. and. And um, and the member states just did what they very often do, very often they do, because there was a lack of EU institutions uh, visibility as well. Um, they defended national interests, right? Mm -hmm. So they were thinking about their German citizens and the German minister for interior, we have to shut down the borders because we get them from all, from Italy over the Alps and, and so on and so forth. And this is exactly what the Brexit chapter then shows. The Brexit chapter shows very nicely that we need those supranational institutions, right, in order to get us out of this national kind of perspective and this knee-jerk kind of quick reaction, which we normally would develop at the national member state, to actually have supranational organizations forcing us to raise the question, is there a problem that is a European problem that needs to be fixed with a European solution? And once we have ticked those boxes, we become active. And then we organize conferences, right, to collect money, to uh, invest in, in the discovery of new vaccines, um, and so on and so forth. But this is a step that is always needed, and it takes always a little bit more time yeah. than... Yeah, so it's right? slower. Yeah. Senna, what would be your, thank you. Senna, what would be your take on this? Why do you think countries like Turkey reacted so swiftly? Well, I mean, number of reasons. Um, first of all, the yeah, I agree with, first of all, it has to do with timing. So I have to agree with Michael there in the sense that it was hit relatively a little bit later than, for instance, um, countries like Italy, right? Um, secondly, um, the health system. 
Um, the Turkish health system is, in terms of health, is, the capacity, it's, it's, it's quite, it does quite well. And this is something that goes way back even before AKP, but it was strengthened further than many uh, ways by the AKP governments as well. So the health system uh, stood quite firm. So that had something to do with it. And thirdly, of course, uh, one can say that sometimes when you, of course, it's, it's difficult to articulate this now uh, uh, without saying something positive, <laughs> because I don't try to say anything that there's anything <laughs> positive that's associated with an authoritarian way of governance. But, you know, um, at least sometimes in some crisis Absolutely, situations, yes. I think one has to give it to, you know, one has to um say that attest that you know it, it sometimes helps in the sense that you know decisions can then easily trickle down Fast. from top mm. to bottom when you need to act very fast in and and when you don't have for instance a very sort of healthy functioning parliament that can debate you know what to do or where to do or opposition parties um articulating different positions then once you have an authoritarian government that doesn't really have rely on checks and balances sometimes they can just go ahead with it you know 99% uh, of the time it results in disastrous consequences but in very sort of certain specific cases uh, like this initial uh, wave of the crisis it might help mm -hmm. thank you thank you um before uh, turning to Katarina, we have a question for the audience and him as well. How can the lack of solidarity of European countries change the dynamics of the domestic political situation in Turkey? How can it affect the support for the current uh, establishment. So what would you say, Sanam? An interesting question. Yeah, a very good question. Thank you. Um, well, I think we need to be a little bit fair as well, right? I mean, when we say there is a lack, I don't think we can talk about a complete lack because there are political groups in the EU and there are certain civil society institutions, organizations, et cetera, that do engage, uh, that do, for instance, follow high profile um, cases against human rights defenders, you know, that you know, try to make a case in the European Parliament, et cetera. So I don't think it would be fair to say that there is a total lack, there isn't. But of course, especially at the governmental level, there seems to be, an absence or perhaps a concern to engage too much so that you know the, the modus vivendi with the current Turkish government might be upset and that that could have ramifications for migration deal for eastern Mediterranean and and for other potential conflicts and for economic of course concerns right so I think what could be done again from a policy perspective and again in response to this question is perhaps for uh, Europe to be prepared of what might come um, in the coming years in a possible post Erdogan phase and engage early on. I mean, this might not be from today to tomorrow, but it will most likely happen in the next, I don't know, five to 10 years or whatever. It's very hard to tell. So, but it's much better to engage early on and to invest in these mm. developments so that it can have a stake also in whatever is happening. But other than that, of course, a change of government, et cetera, these are things that in the current circumstances will mostly happen if they do happen due to largely the domestic dynamics of Turkey and Turkish opposition and Turkish society at large, including of course, its reactions to the Turkish economy and other factors. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Katharina, uh, two questions for you. One is, I think um, Michal already mentioned this, Baltic bubble, do you still feel that there is something like a Nordic bubble, broadly speaking, including including Denmark in terms of solidarity? Or is it really, um, I just uh, yesterday ran across an article in the Politico uh, arguing what has happened to the liberal Denmark with the growing influence of the you know, Danish People's Party and even though there is social democratic government. So is there, is there a kind of closing up or is the space at least in within the Nordic cooperation uh, op remaining open for solidarity? What would you say is the current situation and the current development there? I actually think the Danish-Swedish uh, relationship is at, it's, um, at quite a low point at the moment. Partly maybe because, as you say, the reputation of Denmark has been that we have somehow left this more liberal bubble 
we are quite outspoken on uh, migration asylum centers outside the EU on, 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 and many cases where we go to the limits of existing conventions and so on, where Sweden has more maintained the more liberal traditional Nordic perspective. And I think that has led to quite some accusations flowing between our two mm -hmm. countries with, mm -hmm. with the Denmark accusing Sweden of being more naive and Sweden accusing Denmark of giving up on, on core humanitarian values. So that relationship is actually not quite strong. It was really lived a little bit in the frugal alliance, but in many other examples, uh, Sweden and Denmark are not really in the same camp. Um, we have now this case about the minimum wage, which is huge in yes. Denmark where Denmark is very afraid of uh, signing up to a directive on the minimum wage. And it's very likely to be seen as being unsolidaric now that we have this theme for the webinar, because why not support the efforts of workers with low wages getting more salaries in, in the rest of Europe? But we are afraid of this undermining our own system. Sweden was supposed to be in the same camp as Denmark, but has chosen to support this directive. So I think there is a growing uh, divergency, a growing um, distinct paths between the two countries. So I'd say the, the sort of Nordic bubble is a bit less strong than it has been for a long time. And the Baltic bubble, I don't really see one either. I think there are very few direct relations uh, on EU policy between Denmark and the Baltic countries, for instance, despite very close historic ties and, and a number of similarities. I wouldn't really say that. I mean, we, we, are in a, we are in a constant search for allies after the UK left but it's really still ongoing. There's no um, very close circle of allies. How would you how would you explain one more question that kind of uh, still I have to think about it? How do you how do you explain this? Uh, as you, as you mentioned, Denmark is one of the countries that with the highest trust, uh, high level of solidarity internally in the society, right? And uh, the growing lack uh, thereof externally is that. Is that a paradox or a you know, contradiction, or is that something that you find kind of logical that you know it closes off, keeps what we have and, and doesn't want to share externally? Don't you find it's paradoxical? Well, yeah, I think it's a bit um it's it's a bit one-sided because I think you're very right. There's a kind of a Danish bubble. It's a very egalitarian country, some of the highest tax rates, but people pay taxes very happily almost. I think that's some service I found that it's even with, with pride and joy and something because it's going to, or at least until recently, it was seen as going to other days and everyone high and low could, could recognize themselves. There's very little um, gaps. I mean, compared to other countries, it's a very flat society and people have very much cherished that. And I think now that <clears throat> the, the, there have been crisis after crisis showing that the nation state alone cannot is not really uh, adequate to respond to some of these events. I think that is dawning a bit more on Danes than it has been previously. And I think Michael's point on talking more about interdependencies is extremely important for a country like Denmark, where we're so used to thinking, oh, European integration is only about us handing over a little bit of our treasured sovereignty to the EU in response for some trade relations. And I think the picture is much broader. As we saw when we shut the borders in 11th of March, I think we were one of the very first EU countries to shut the borders. Um, it was before the green corridors were introduced by the commission. And, but obviously we would not have had the food on our supermarket shelves if we had not had the supranational response. Uh, but there was never any debate about this in Denmark. So I think we need mm -hmm. to somehow, as a start to, to and you also asked in the beginning, how do we promote European solidarity? I think we need right. to start talking more about the interdependencies that Michael suggested. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, it seems to me um, uh, my kind of major takeaway from our discussion is here that indeed the national positions seem to be uh, quite different and quite fragmented, right? So my, and that's perhaps the, because we are almost out of time. Uh, that would be my final question, you know, to bind it back together to our topic, uh, solidarity in the EU. Uh, so we have covered the views from the capitals, but now coming <laughs> back to uh, how this can be, uh, how, how can we come back, right? How can we uh, tie the knots together again? Is there a way or are there some ways that you see which are possible, and, and it seems to me, I follow the situation in Central Europe, 
that the political direction, I mean, the, the trend is in the other direction, right? So I'm wondering, are there any measures? I, mean, I know that Senem already mentioned some, but are there any practical steps that you uh, would recommend? And the book, by the way, contains also recommendations, right? So perhaps starting with Michael again, are there some practical measures that can be yeah. in the short or medium term yeah. Uh, taken to to remedy the situation. Yeah. I think, yeah. I mean, there there are probably a handful. I mean, first of all, I think what this book and the individual chapters makes very clear is that we have we have to make capitals, but also the institutions make um, make them think about solidarity, and to, to understand that in the end, solidarity follows interdependence, right? To to have this kind of narrative on the one hand, but also that. European solidarity requires a form of European identity. Hmm. Uh, and that's another step, a very important step, a very difficult step, I know. But in the end, there are different ways of, of achieving this, right? So there are many chapters come back in the end to this concept of European um, identity in very different forms. But one very practical one in the Swedish chapter, for example, it's just a very simple, minor, tiny thing, but just increasing the exchanges, the city exchanges between Swedish cities and cities in, let's say, not the obvious countries, right? Uh, and so really to get to know people on the countryside uh, beyond also the capitals uh, in uh, more than just one country that we already know because it's a distinct holiday destination for Swedes, right? So. I think, and, and, and just ensuring to have these exchanges and to, to meet each other, to talk to each other, to listen to each other and to show the interest. Um, this is a very practical um, um, example of um, how to get our idea around European identity, accepting that European solidarity requires forms um, and, and more enhanced forms of European identity in the future. Thank you. Thank you. So we are coming back to identity, um, uh, a never ending uh, conundrum for the European uh, studies. Uh, Senem, what would you add to that? Yes, I mean, I already said a few things, you know, when I in my first intervention about where I see some, you know, scope for uh, solidarity between EU and Turkey, that is. And it's interesting because basically what Michael is saying is also something that can be applied to the Turkish case as well, right? More and more engagement at the youth level, particularly the Turkish youth, which politically speaking stands, most of the you know, majority of Turkish youth stands at a very different position than the Tur current Turkish government on many things, including you know, climate change, political values, freedoms, etc. And, you know, think of it in a long term perspective, again, and be prepared and engage for it. And I think also realize that many of these challenges, I mean, again, going back to this notion of interdependency, which I think is very important, because this is not just a matter that concerns intra EU countries, but also EU and neighboring states like Turkey, right? And when you think of interdependency, of course, things like migration, etc, pop up, but I think perhaps even more importantly, today, we have the climate crisis. Um, where you, when we look at what's happened during the summer, look at all the wildfires that happened, mm. right, in Turkey and Greece, right, in southern Europe, that were basically struck by climate change. And I think, unfortunately, we might see more and more of that happening. Um, and where, you know, you know, basically, you know, responding to uh, one context will just not be enough, right? You will have to res develop responses that are pan-European, that are larger than just the EU, that are regional in order to really to be able to combat with this. So the Green Deal would be important. Having Turkey in the context of that would be important, you know, perhaps even despite the Turkish government and its generally dominant anti-Western position. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Katharina, uh, what can be done from, from the Danish perspective? Well, maybe inspired by what Senem just said, I think, I mean, also thinking about types of solidarity because it's, it's, we also heard about now the Irish case, which was political solidarity, um, in, in, clearly with the COVID fund and the financial crisis was financial solidarity. But, but what kind of, I mean, what different displays, you mentioned send them the like, uh, wildfires. Um, there might be many different ways of showing solidarity and some of them might be 
quite uncontroversial, but still really visible to the average citizen that there is assistance in the need in the times of need. And I think maybe there are many ways this could be done, you know, better with a more smooth and flexible way of of, uh, of making sure there is a this crisis, this tool, what's it called, the emergency break, or that this somehow is increased to also neighboring countries outside the EU, and there are many ways of offering assistance where it's coordinated and more efficient in that way. But yeah, I think the different kind, I mean, Lithuania now might expect some EU solidarity uh, on its China policy and so on, but it, I think we are, we, are, we are far away from the, the more political, we, with Brexit, I'm quite astonished that it's still there. But, uh, but I think focusing on the lower, less politicized issues might be the way to start because hmm. we're still, yeah, Thank we're you. all humans. And I think this, we don't need a thick layer of EU identity to, to, uh, to display solidarity with any country if there's a wildfire or something. So it start and at the bottom and go up, yeah. Indeed, thank you. Uh, again, I, I think a, a common feature in what all three of you suggested is, is you know, a, like an implicit critique of the state-centric view of solidarity, right? That solidarity uh, runs from the European identity to people, to a person-to-person -person relations, your neighbor in across the sea in Turkey and then Greece, we have the same problem with the wildfire, right? So. Uh, this is probably something that uh, I think might be the big takeaway for all of us also to think about how uh, we can overcome the state-centric understanding of solidarity that still underlies much of the discussions about solidarity in the EU, including in the legal text. So thank you very much. This has been uh, really uh, a stimulating talk with all three of you, and I'm really happy that we have had such a diverse group of uh, excellent speakers. So let me thank you again for being with us. I would like to also thank to our audience. Uh, this is a kind of uh, teaser on top of being great discussion for the book. So please, uh, it should be out in January, Michael, if I'm right. Uh, so please um, have a look at it. And thank you again and have a nice evening. Thank you for coming. Goodbye.